How's it going, everybody? You're listening to the Music Production Podcast, and I am your host, Brian Funk. I make music as Afro DJ Mac. I'm an Ableton certified trainer, and today is an exciting day for Ableton people all over the world because Live 10 has just been announced. I've had some time to play around with Live 10, got my hands on it over the summer. So it's been a secret I've been struggling to keep. And right now, you're hearing the last few seconds of some chords I've been playing with the Wavetable synth. Um, today's episode is going to be a little different. Uh, I'm going to talk about Ableton Live 10 and the things that I'm pretty excited about, what I think is cool. And uh, I'm going to be doing some sound examples as we go, I think, uh, such as that little example Wavetable. Um, I think it's going to be fun. You know, I was driving around a lot today and I wanted to catch up on what was going on with the release and I didn't have videos to watch. So I figured there must be other people out there that are in the same position where they want to hear about Live 10 and maybe don't have time to sit down and watch a 42 minute video on Wavetable, which I am just releasing myself. I, I had some time, so I made a nice long video tutorial, but, um, you know, we'll just, uh, see how this goes. So first thing I guess I'll start off with is a uh, wave table. And right now you are actually hearing a little bit of noise too. I'll turn that up a bit. That's also the echo device using some of its noise modulation, noise parameter. That's part of it that makes it sound more like in a, an authentic analog delay machine. But more on that in a minute. Let's talk about Wavetable. This is a beast, a monster of a synth. It's super cool, super fun. It's really, really deep, and it's also very approachable. That's one thing I think is really cool about it. They managed to take something so complex and make it really approachable and friendly. And I think that's something I've always sort of appreciated about the look of Ableton Live, is that everything has this kind of uniform look. All the knobs look the same. The filters look the same, the envelopes look the same. And I've heard this be a critique of live before by people that they say it looks kind of plain or boring or something, but I think that's actually really a nice look. I, I don't think it's plain or boring at all. I think it's really um, sleek and um, nice looking, but it's always been kind of weird for me if I'm using another DAW where every single device is this totally different looking thing. It can be kind of hard to jump in and get used to it and understand what does what. There's different looking sliders, different looking knobs on every device. Um, so Wavetable really embraces that Ableton Live aesthetic in which it looks like another live device, but they've really kind of... Um, up the game with the way it breaks out with the little triangle that you can click that'll give you an expanded view of the wavetable synth and you see that on certain devices like their eq8 you can expand this frequency spectrum and get a better look at what's going on but this is like next level it, it can fill up the whole screen um really nice looking so what is wavetable well you may have guessed it's a wavetable synthesizer which means there's a ton of different waves that you can choose from waveforms now most synthesizers, you know, will have kind of your traditional, maybe a sine wave, triangle wave, square wave, those types of things. But a wavetable synth has many more and much more complicated waves. So I'm not sure what the exact count is for wavetable, but there has got to be hundreds of them. I mean, I get lost sometimes just exploring the different wavetables that they have. So you get two oscillators and you get to combine two different waves. And each one of these wave tables is morphable. So you can kind of take a sound that's pretty simple and then make it into something much more complicated. And it's really fun to play with. Um, it's got a sub oscillator. It's got crazy modulation capabilities and the matrix that they've designed is really beautiful. Every time you click on something on the device, it shows up in the matrix and it's a grid uh, I imagine kind of like the Matrix Brute by Arturia, where you kind of just click the spot where the two things intersect. So you might have, like, say, your filter frequency and LFO2, and they are in a grid and they intersect at a point, and then you can add that amount of um, modulation to your filter using LFO2. Really clever, and uh, the way it pops up is just super easy to follow. The integration with Push2 is 
also incredible. Um, you can really get lost in just using the synth right off of push. And just about every parameter that I can think of is there. I, I wasn't able to see if I could change the polyphony of the synth from push to, but that's the only thing I can think of. And that's really kind of minor. That's not something you're really like modulating as you're using the synth. So I think that's sort of, you set it once and then you kind of go on with your sound design and performance. Um, so Wavetable is going to really um, produce some awesome new sounds, I think, in music in the world today. I think we're going to find that there's some really interesting things happening with it. Sound designers are going to have a, you know, a real party once they start playing around with this. And um, in the time I've spent with it, I've been able to design my own patches really easily and it's just a synth you get lost in. And that's kind of a mark of a really great instrument for me is when I can just kind of like forget I'm even playing with an instrument, forget I'm even tinkering, forget I'm even sound designing. I'm just lost in the universe that it creates. And that's something we're getting with Wavetable. Uh, I think you're all going to be very excited about that. And uh, if you are so interested, I do have about a 40-minute video exploring it, um, walking you through all the different parameters, showing you how it works on push, at the same time showing you how it works on the screen. And the it wasn't hard to do both at the same time because they both work together so well. So I think that comes across nicely. Uh, the other device I said you were hearing was Echo. And Echo is sort of like a emulation of those classic tape-based delays, but it's not just one particular one. And it's definitely been you know, catapulted into the modern age, but it's such a fun sound design tool. You can do so much with it. And, uh, you know, the possibilities are pretty wild. Um, I'm going to drop it on a track here inside a live. And I'm going to play a drum beat to go along with it so we can just kind of hear what Echo is actually doing. So here's just a simple drum beat with a 707 kit. And I'm going to go in here and just let you hear what Echo is doing to our drums here. You know, turn down the dry wet a little bit. And um, it's a nice uh, sounding uh, kind of a dub delay type of thing. We can make our different uh, echoes independent of each other. We've got ping pong, stereo. We can even do like a mid side thing where the stuff in the middle gets delayed differently from the stuff on the sides. Um, but kind of what I wanted to show you, less than even that, is just uh, some of the fun things you can do with the character of this particular sound. So I'm going to actually just kill my drums, and I'm just going to crank up the feedback a little bit. And I'm going to go to our character and add some noise. And this is like noise from the machine that you're hearing. I'll make it nice and loud. <laughs> and you can morph the noise. And uh, what I think is really fun about this, you get almost like a line noise and different types of character, but it's, you can run this thing into itself and start getting some like really cool feedback. And there's also a nice filter in here, so you can filter this out and use just the echo device as a sound design tool. Which I think is awesome. It's got a reverb on it too, just to give it a little extra space. Let's bring that down so we don't get too out of control here and I'll turn it off. But uh, just to suffice to say that echo is exciting. It's uh, more than just an echo device. It's really much deeper than that. And you can have quite a lot of fun with it. Um, one of the other devices I'm having a blast with is uh, Drum Bus, and this is a drum effects processor. I'm going to put this on that drum track again and let you hear the drums. And I'll turn this on. I'm going to turn this track down a little bit just because the Drum Bus is going to make it a little bit louder. So I'll turn that down some. And now I've got Drum Bus running, and it's got a nice drive control for some nice kind of crunch and distortion. It goes from soft to medium to hard. You get some like heavy distortions. It's got a compressor built in. It's just a one button compressor. So it's nice for um, just kind of a, you know, plain 
easy compression. You know, you don't have to think about it too hard. Uh, crunch is another type of distortion. I uh, always have like a damping control, which is nice for taming your crunch. Um, one of the real nice features is the transients control. So I can increase the transients and lower the sustain of the drums by turning this one knob to the left. And now you notice my drums are really tight and punchy and I'm losing a lot of the sustain. This is with it off now, much more sustain. And then I can actually go in the other direction, increase the transients and increase the sustain. So you're really hearing like the tail being boosted on that. Um, I think a nice way to illustrate this is to put a reverb on the drums, which I'll do there. Now this reverb is before my drum bus, and now I'll crank my transient. We're really hearing that reverb. But if I bring it back the other way, now I'm losing all that decay. So I'm not affecting the reverb right now. I'm actually just using this transient knob on drum bus, and it's kind of taking all of that reverb away because it's killing the decay. I turn it back up. Now I actually emphasize the tail of the reverb. We'll turn off our reverb, and I'll bring my transients back to a neutral place so it's not having any effect. I've got a boom control on here, and this allows you to add like a tone to your drums. And this is 50 hertz right now, so it might be a little tough to hear if you're not listening on a system that can handle that. But I'm gonna turn up the pitch, turn it to 87, and we're getting a nice long boom. This is great for tuning your drums. You can choose the frequency, and it actually tells you what note you are getting too. And you can click on this button with the note, and live will tune it to the nearest note. So right here, I'm at 61, I click that, and live tunes it to the B, which happens to be around 61. If I go to about 40, I click this, and now live brings me to an E. And I can turn that boom off so you can hear the difference. This is really nice if you want to get those like really heavy uh, hip hop type drums. i turn off my drums now because I don't think we need to hear that too much anymore. That's drum bus, really super awesome device. Um, but as cool as the devices are in the new update, and that's often like the focus of any update to a piece of software, I guess it's what sells it. Um, to me, it's those aren't even the coolest parts about um, Live 10. Um, some of the cooler parts are more the workflow stuff. Um, and by that, I mean things that just like improve your ability to use the software. So the big one for me is this feature called Capture. So Capture is basically, it works only with MIDI. So that's important to point out. Um, it does not work with audio, but it works with MIDI. And basically, Live is recording even if you're not recording. So you play something on a MIDI track, and if you didn't record, you forgot to record, you just use the Capture button or use a little shortcut on Push, which is Hold, Record, and Press New. And Live will create a MIDI clip from what you've done. And it's really smart. It's very accurate. Um, just something you want to make sure you do is you start on your downbeat and you end on a downbeat, which is pretty easy to do. I mean, if you're jamming along, having fun, and you realize you got something good, just end on the first downbeat of the next bar. And then Live's pretty good at like figuring out what you did. And even if it's a little bit off, you can then go into the MIDI clip and edit it. And what I really like about this is, of course, you know, it's nice. It takes away the pressure of having to record. And something I think I've even talked about on this podcast is us as, uh, you know, home producers, especially, we're doing the job of a lot of people. We're recording, we're performing, we're mixing, we're doing all these things at once, we're engineering. So in a normal studio setting, traditionally, that would be the job of many people, but when we're doing it by ourselves, we're kind of worrying about all that stuff. And sometimes you forget things. How many times have you forgotten to press record <laughs> when you're making a track? I mean, it happens all the time. Uh, I do it all the time. It's so embarrassing when you're doing it with people, but um, it does happen. You just forget to hit record. But Capture will kind of like just remember what you did, which is really cool. But what I really like about it 
is it lets me play my MIDI instruments a little bit more like I play my guitar. Because in the past, normally I would set the tempo, maybe put on a metronome or maybe use a clip or something, but I'd have something like keeping time for me. And I'd be playing along with that. It might even just be like a, a little simple drum beat and I'd play some keyboards or something. But now I can just play, not think about tempo. And then when a cool idea comes out, I can go and hit capture and go back to it. And that's so much more like I would play my guitar. You know, I'm playing guitar. I'm not setting up metronomes and like committing myself to like, you know, 111 BPM or something like that. I just play and I feel it out. And later on, I figure out what the tempo was and I figure out all that technical stuff. But it's about the emotion. It's about just feeling it and just going. And now you can do that with your MIDI. You don't have to think about that stuff. And that part of it i think is kind of been understated in all of the uh promotional stuff i've seen or the reviews i've seen or the uh you know kind of first looks in live 10 i don't think uh i don't think the gravity of that has really hit everybody that you can now not worry about that stuff and not be tied down by tempos and metronomes and all these like things that make us more stiff in our playing you just kind of play and then tell live, hey, I liked what I did. And it's like, okay, this is about the tempo you had and this is what I think you played. And it's, as far as I've experienced, it's like, you know, 95% of the time, I'm really happy with the results and I can just move on. And this is great for live performance because now you can just go and play live. You can just make up a beat, boom, it captures it, and then just throw another part on top. And now you're, you're going and you didn't have to even worry about like getting your loop points right. You've just let the computer do it for you. And it's, uh, it's a little bit like Big Brother is always watching you, but it's in a good way. Big Brother's helping you in this case. So capture is sick. Um, that's something I think people are going to really love the more they use it. And uh, it's been like kind of tough when I use Live 9 to like have to like go back to that old way of working, which we've all come accustomed to. So capture is pretty awesome. A uh, big thing you're going to hear about is multi-clip editing. People have been asking for that a long time, and it's definitely nice. It's cool to be able to see all of your MIDI notes that you have on multiple clips on one instance of the piano roll. That's what multi-clip editing is. It's just your MIDI clips, you select a bunch of clips, and then you see one piano roll with all the different notes on there, and they're color-coded, and they're kind of like in the background if they're not the ones that are selected or in focus, and you can easily switch between them. It makes it really easy to line up your music uh, rhythmically and also melodically, understand how everything's interacting. Really nice. It's getting a lot of attention, I think, is one of the big features, and sure it is. It's very helpful. Um, Multi-clip editing is very cool. Um, some of the other workflow stuff, though, that is going on in Live 10 is the kind of stuff I think that... After you try it out and see it in action, you just sort of forget it's there. And a lot of this stuff I've realized I've been using only when I go back to Live 9 and I try to do whatever it is I'm doing and I realize, oh, wait, that's not, that's not working here. That's a new feature. Um, some of the things in, in that uh, case would be like um, the way Live deals with automation now. You kind of uh, have a global automation button that you can activate with the A key. So it's a real simple hot key, just A, you know, not even shift A or anything, just A. And it shows all the automation on all your tracks and you can put it away just as easy. Um, automation also is just more sensible with um, how you edit it. You can just double click and it makes a break point. You don't have to click on the line. And that was always a kind of annoying thing. You'd have to like get your cursor right on the line. Um, it snaps to the grid which again, to me, seems kind of sensible. Why wouldn't it snap to the grid? Um, but you can always, of course, not have it snap to the grid by um, holding down Command. I think it's Command. Um, I'll have to do it in a second, but yeah. <laughs> um, 
it it's just very fluid. And then when you go back, you know, to use Live Nine, you're kind of like, oh, hey, why is this so complicated to do? How come、uh, these are all moving in a weird way? And I highlight something, and now everything gets all messed up.、Um, and that's one of those workflow enhancements that you just kind of forgets there because it's just natural. And that's always like kind of a fear I have.、Um, When things get updated, is what if they take away something I like or change something I really like that I've come to rely on, or like I'd have to relearn the software? And I'm not feeling that at all with Live Ten. I haven't, you know, right away when I got my hands on it, it was just like,、oh, okay, this is just how it goes now, and you moved on. And it was more like, this is more sensible anyway. This makes Makes things easier. This is the logical way to do it. This is how it kind of should have been in the first place. You got things like zooming that's been improved.、Um, your fades.、Uh, I don't understand why fades would have been so complicated in Ableton Live for so long, where you had to right click in the arrangement view to just show the fades on the edges of your your clips.、Um, You know, I know Pro Tools from day one that I ever used it. You just click on the top right corner of your little clip and your Timeline, and you just create a fade. And Logic had that, and Logic even had the、uh, pitch thing, which was really cool. Logic has this feature where the fade at the end can also be、uh, pitch fades, so you can draw a fade like you would at the end of any、uh, any clip in your arrangement view in Logic. And instead of fading out the volume, would actually like fade out the pitch, which was such a cool effect. So you'd get your clips have this like. Pew! Effect at the end, and I used and abused that <laughs> quite a bit when I was using Logic. I do miss that still in Live, but finally, Live has just simple fades. You don't have to right click to show them; it's just there. You just grab it, and it might not sound like much. Right clicking, show fades, and then you move it. But you know, it's two seconds that maybe you don't want to waste, and I don't want to waste two seconds ever. <laughs> and not when I'm doing little fades, so it's there all the time, and it's really nice.、Um, <clears throat> something else that's cool that uh, I've uh, had a problem with in the past is the way saving and undo works. So in the past, if you hit save, you lose your undo history. So once you save, you can't undo anything anymore. So in Live Nine, you hit save, you can't undo anything. Now. The hotkey command for save is on a Mac and is Command S. PC is Control S, I believe, but Command S. That's pretty darn close to Command A, which is select all, and also really close to Command D, which is really useful. It's duplicate, and even Command X, Command C, like they're all pretty close to Command S. So if you were Kind of fooling around trying something, you accidentally miss your D key when you're trying to d- duplicate something. You save, and now you've overridden your undo history, and that can be a bit frustrating. But now, when you save, you retain your undo history, so you can undo back before you saved. And part of that feature is, I guess, the new backup system in Live. You can. Every time you save, you get some backups of your project. I think it gives you ten backups, so you can go back to ten saves ago. So if you really kind of screw up, you can just go back. And this also will prevent you from having to constantly save as and have sixty-four different versions of the same project. And I've done that, and I get confused on which one was which, which was the good one. But now I can just restore backup if I need to. So that's one of those things that. You know, I didn't r- realize it was really important until you go back to Live Nine and realize it's not there. You know, you hit your Command A because you wanted to select everything, but you actually hit S, and now you've killed your undo history.、Um, simple little things that are fun are just、um, you can name your inputs and outputs on your audio interface. So instead of having audio one, audio two, audio three, audio four, you can name. Mic one, mic two, overhead drum mic, kick drum mic. You can name it. Profit six input.、Um, you know whatever synths you're using, hardware gear. You're running something. You know instead of having to remember that, audio out eleven is to your distortion pedal. 
you can just write distortion pedal for 11 and it'll show up when you select your ins and outs inside of live. And for me, I, you know, again, didn't think a lot about that one when I first saw it, but it's gotten rid of all these little scraps of paper that I keep around the studio telling me like what input is what, what is plugged into where. And that's great. I mean, those scraps of paper, it's just clutter. And I don't like clutter. I think it distracts me from my work. So that's a little thing that's been pretty helpful. Um, the browser has been improved a bit. You can update your packs straight from Ableton's uh, browser, Ableton Live's browser. And that's really nice because you would really have no way of knowing that a pack you owned got updated. And sometimes there were critical updates and especially with some of the Max for Live devices, like sometimes weird things would happen as Max got updated or Live got updated and they would always get updated separately. So you would never know if you had the most recent version. You just have to download it and see or just catch word of mouth from someone else that figured it out. Um, now, when you go under your packs, you can see what packs you have available that you haven't downloaded yet and what updates you have. And you can do it all straight from the browser. So you don't have to go into the internet and go to Ableton site, log in, go to your account, figure out which pack you need. It's, it's a lot more convenient, a nice feature. And again, kind of a simple one that doesn't sound incredibly useful, but if it saves you five minutes from going on that site and trying to figure it out, I think that's great. You've also got the ability to kind of uh, color code your presets. So you can have, they're basically like your own categories. You can name them whatever you want. They start off being called colors. There's seven of them. They start out red, orange, yellow, but you can rename them to other things. So you might name them like um, synth pads or something that I like, or my favorite uh, percussion or I don't know. I've, I've seen people naming it by mood, which I thought was a kind of cool idea. Um, you know, whatever you want, however you want to categorize things, which again is another handy little thing that'll speed up your workflow. And I think that is one of the big things about this update that I like is that it's enhancing my workflow. It's not disrupting it. It's not changing it too much. And it's also just making things smoother without me having to relearn everything. I kind of just already know what's new. If it makes sense, I got it. And um, it's nothing too complicated that I have to refigure out. On top of that, uh, what else is cool is Push 2 is really, really coming into its own in a wonderful way. The display is just really taking advantage of here. Um, just some like cool things you can see on your display now. You get to see when you have an EQ8, you can see the frequency spectrum. So you can actually watch your music move right on push, which is great. It's so helpful. It's another thing that takes your eyes off that computer screen. Um, the compressor as well, for instance, you can see the waveform and what the compressor is actually doing. That's very handy. It's nice to see on there. Uh, Wavetable and Echo are two devices that make great use of Push's display, and uh, it's really fun to use those devices with Push. Um, and overall, um, there's a new layout for your notes mode when you're playing a melodic instrument. That's a great, great time saver. Um, the melodic step sequencer on Push was cool, but I found it kind of difficult to make a lot of use of because you really only get seven rows of buttons. The top row is always your loop selector. So although it was fun and nice, you were doing a lot of scrolling up and down the octaves to do any kind of meaningful work. But now you've kind of got like a half um, note mode, which is the traditional one with a, you know, um, the traditional mode where you can actually perform and play like a keyboard, but then the top row is the step sequencer part. Now the way this works though is you kind of play a note on your keyboard part, the kind of performable keyboard, and live remembers whatever you played last, and then you just press where you want it in the sequence. So there's just one kind of uh, one one spot, one uh, pad that will light up for say a chord 
but you'll know that like when your playhead goes over that one little lit up pad that it's a chord that's going to play and to make things a little bit easier you can actually see the piano roll on push now too so that particular layout the third layout which is a melodic step sequence or combination is really really good and it's a nice new way to work again makes ideas a little bit easier to capture so how do i feel about the update i guess that's obvious by now right i i, I love it it's great it's a nice step forward the graphical interface is cleaned up a bit it looks nice it's clean but it's not all it's not drastic either it's the same friendly thing you've come to know if you're a live user but it's just cleaned up it's a little bit flatter the edges are rounder i think uh, the font has changed so it's more of like this ableton font that they've been uh working with their website for quite some time by the way the website is actually looking really great too you know shout out to the people designing the site i love how you can they've got like um an example it says the guitar pedal it's called pedal it's a distortion pedal plug-in device and you've got different types of distortions and on their website it's pretty cool you can play a loop and then you can switch how that loop sounds on the different settings of the pedal and um, i think it's a it's just like um, a nice advance in website technology and i think the ableton website is actually one of the nicer websites uh, for just about anything it's really flashy but simple you know like lots of big pictures and easy to navigate but it's not complicated it's just pretty simple and clear and it's is you know uh the integration of videos is great but you know that's uh just kind of a fun thing if you're into web design at all and you know i make my own website afrodjmac.com shout out i make that site so i think about that a little bit and uh that Ableton website is beautiful so they've really even stepped it up quite nicely the photographs of the different studios to help illustrate the new product is great and the way they allow you to just sort of try out the new effects right on the website is pretty cool I think Electron did something like that when they came out with the analog heat they did uh, where you can play a loop and hear the different settings of heat and that's actually a very nice integration of a similar idea too but uh right now this ableton live 10 is in beta and i think it's now open to the public or will be soon anyway um, and next week is the loop conference i think it's pretty cool too to say um I'd like to just throw this out there um loop is such i've never been but um I've seen it from afar on the internet. I've spoken to a lot of people that have been there. And what I love about it is it's not so Ableton centric. So it's not about like some new thing coming out from Ableton. Although the first year they came out with uh, push Two at loop, but um, you know, since then it's just been more about the concept, the discussions, the, the philosophy behind making music and being creative. And I think it's really nice that they kind of just announced Live 10 ahead of the game, like ahead of Loop. Loop is next week. And um, at the time of this recording, this is October 2nd. But it's nice that they did that ahead of time so that the focus of the event is not like waiting for some big product and it doesn't feel like as much of a commercial. So, you know, I, I think that's a cool move by Ableton and um just another uh reason why i think they're a cool company um as a certified trainer they are super supportive and have built such an active community it's no wonder the users are so the users are so fiercely loyal and it's really a reflection of what they're doing as a company so yeah go ableton ableton live 10 is awesome like i said i got a couple months under my belt and it is uh, really everything I could have hoped for some things I never even dreamed of uh, yeah I mean we could nitpick we could probably figure out a few things that we wish were there but um, you know I think it's important to get what you have right and live 10 is solid I've I don't I haven't had a crash in a long time and I've been 
kind of, uh, I've been kind of messing with it a little bit, trying to break it sometimes. And it's really snappy. It's resilient. It loads fast. Uh, Max for Live is super stable now too, because Max for Live is bundled within Ableton Live 10. It's not as much of an add-on. So when you open a Max for Live device, it feels like you're just opening anything else, just like loading another device. Uh, there's no splash screen Max for Live. It's just there. So that's even really solid. And that has a lot to do, I'm sure, with Ableton acquiring Cycling 74. But uh, the whole experience is great. It it loads faster. It loads samples faster. It runs smooth. The CPU is great. Um, I'm super happy. And I think you will be too if you are an Ableton Live user. This is the most logical and sensible step in the next direction. And I think they've done some great work the whole team in Berlin and here in the States. Um, really been a pleasure to see this all come together. So yeah, check it out. Check out some of my videos. I've got a whole bunch. I put up five today on release day. I've been waiting to do these. I've got my 42 minute wavetable one coming out too. That'll be number six. Um, so I think um, it's gonna be a lot of fun. And I didn't do quite as much music as I thought I would, but I did a little bit. So uh, hopefully that was interesting for you. Something a little different on this show that is always ever-changing, the Music Production Podcast. Thanks again for listening. This is Brian Funk. Again, I make music as Afro DJ Mac. Uh, please check out my site, afrodjmac.com. Got tons of Ableton Live resources, free live packs. I just released number 162, which is a harpsichord instrument. I owe most of the credit to Charlie McCarron and Mitchell Adam Johnson because they did the heavy lifting. They sampled Mitchell's harpsichord, and it's called Mitchell's Harpsichord, the free pack. And I believe Charlie, well, I don't know exactly the division of labor here, but uh, Charlie made these instruments, I assume, with Mitchell and sent them over to me. Well, it's one instrument, but it's multi-sampled, every single note of the harpsichord. It's beautiful. And... I did some finishing touches, fooled around a little bit. I made an extra instrument that's mostly with uh, the, these extra samples of them noodling around with the strings on the harpsichord. I think it came out kind of fun. But the instrument's great. It's free. I hope you check it out. Um, and if you want to support this podcast, we've got a Patreon page, Mac, patreon.com slash Mac. But uh, the best way for me, if you want to help out, is go to my store, check something out, maybe join my music production club, or even better... If you want, don't want to do that, go to iTunes. Go to wherever you get your podcasts. Leave me a review. Tell me what you think. Say hello on Twitter, Facebook, all that. Um, this is the reason I'm doing this is to connect with you guys and interact and share my thoughts on music production and mix them with yours and hopefully grow in the process and expand my palette and become a better artist and... Um, I think uh, this has been a great journey so far. So anyway, going to get going now. Thanks a lot for listening. Have a great day.